All right. I think we're live. We're live. We're live. Yes. Um, so Jackson and I have been wanting to visit about uh, rangeland or not ran or conservation in whole sort of and that related to um, ranching and farming and that kind of stuff. But Jansen, Jackson uh, was working with the neighbor, Nature Conservancy when I first met him and was doing some really cool things with uh, different strategies to make um, ranch lands more attainable for any type of rancher. And so I'll just let you sort of introduce yourself, sort of say what you uh, have done in the past and what you want to look forward to doing too in the future. And uh, just anything sure. that, uh, yeah. Sure, <laughs> go for it. Um, yeah, my name is Jackson Moeller. Um, I've got more than a decade of experience with conservation um, work, uh, government agencies, nonprofits, private industry, um, the last five years or so with the Nature Conservancy in Colorado. Um, and I think I was a, an oddball in the land protection world because I, I felt like a closing day is something that, that folks usually celebrate in land protection. And for me, um, it felt like opening day. It felt like now we've got this great relationship. Um, how right? Like how, we're partners now. Um, I need to find resources for you to make this um, more appealing financially, and other resources with universities, and and just I felt like um, it was the beginning of a beautiful relationship. Um, and as Rich, you were talking about, um, I think a big a big issue is just getting folks started. I, I feel like there's a lot of people that have that pipe dream of starting a ranch um, or starting a farm. Um, but there are a lot of folks, and we've met a few on LinkedIn that, that have the, the college degree and they're, they're doing like part-time work um, on the side. And it's just, it's not affordable to be able to um, have a place of your own. You can, you can be the, the ranch manager, but to have your own piece of land is really difficult. And so I was working just on a lot of kind of pilot um projects on how do we make this land more affordable I love, can, is it can we walk through the uh pancake is that the right place the last one of the last big projects you worked on oh yeah um there were a few there was one uh fisher's peak was a state park um but there we had other projects where we were looking to um be a short-term owner the the nature conservancy in colorado be the short-term short-term owner um, because we could uh, move faster than, um, than than other organizations, right? So we, uh, if there's a distressed sale, we would come in and buy the ranch and we'd put a conservation easement on the property, um, which lowers the, the price of the real estate. And I can talk about that a little bit if you'd like, just how it works. Yeah, well, let's, we'll get to the easements yeah. here, but let's, yeah. uh, I think that, I, when I first met Jackson, I said to him, uh, because I, we have a history with the Nature Conservancy <laughs> in that part of the world. Yeah, yeah. It, it was, it was it's an interesting uh, dynamics since mm -hmm. from the 90s until now, just yeah. like a 20-year spin. And when I yeah. said, when I met Jackson, I said, man, I can't believe I'm sitting across from the Nature Conservancy. Yeah, I said, yeah. in the 90s, you guys were the villains, and now you're yeah. the heroes. And especially yeah. in regenerative agriculture, what Nature Conservancy's new approach is yeah. that I've seen is really to enable lots of conservation minded programs mm -hmm. and people that are conservation minded and help them to succeed also. So it's not yeah. just uh, uh, focused just on their internal organization, but yeah. on all those surrounding lands. And yeah. uh, so if you want to speak yeah. to that a little bit. Um, a couple of things. I mean, we, everybody's learning. Hopefully, hopefully you're, you're constantly learning. Um, just of, of what works and what doesn't. Um, I think in the past, conservation organizations kind of, you know, those dioramas when you're in elementary school, um, where it's just like, here's like this museum and we're just, we're not gonna touch it. It's just, we're gonna put a little glass jar over it and and watch uh, nature blossom. And we're, we're finding that that's not the case, right? With all the research that it needs to be worked, it needs to be used. Um, Nature is a, a pretty powerful element. And then also, as you know, with, with, with any organization, the organization isn't the entity, right? The, the organization is made up of individual people and, and, indiv and, and especially whether it's, you know, the state 
a you know division of, of fish and game or an oil and gas industry, right? There, there's people that are uh, movers, movers and shakers of every organization. There's people that are like innovators. There, you know. Um, so I wouldn't judge an organization, you know, just by one character, uh, right? Right. right. <laughs> and that sort of leads. Since I'm terrible at scripting anything out, yeah. and I'm not very professional at uh, doing these. That does lead me into an interesting segue. What I wanted to talk to you about. Yeah. And um, so what I've learned since I got into ranch real or real estate, and focusing on ranches, yeah. is the people that are shopping around for ranches have one of three baskets that they're interested mm -hmm. in. Either it's a lifelong dream; they've always wanted to own a ranch. Mm -hmm. They want to hunt on it. So they want to have that exclusive hunting property. Mm -hmm. um, they're either ranchers that are like doing a, oh, I forget what the number is, the 1030 exchange, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or maybe moving out of a place that's less uh, development happens and it crowds people in agriculture into different places. That's a reason for moving to ranch. And then yeah. there's the conservation side of it. And as I've been, doing spreadsheets and running numbers and exploring what really where the heart of the value of a ranch is is become is started to dawn on me that it's sort of a mix of all three absolutely and if you are uh, just um focused on one of them i think that more often than not your experience is not going to be as holistic as if you and that goes for people that ranch right. currently there needs right. to be this broad overall picture of uh, right. conservation, uh, recreation, because I think that yeah. what we'll find is hunting's just sort of a uh, entry. I think that mm -hmm. there's uh, star watchers, mm -hmm. hikers, just right. uh, bird watchers, just right. an enormous amount of potential right. that you can you could, develop. You could think of it as a band, right? Of If you're just listening to the trombone, not not very cool. Um, but if you if you mix them together, it makes beautiful music. And I, th and I think that that's what you're, you're trying to get at it is right that if you're just going in on one aspect of it, you can, I think all of these elements make it um, a great operation. Yeah. So, um, let's talk about the cons conservation component. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. What you've learned in your, um, in your career of what makes positive conservation that sort of uh, I always like to tie everything back to the community where it's from and then you also bring me back and say you got to think about the broader community here and mm -hmm. uh, because it's not just this mic microism of people yeah. that are immediately affected there's this big broad breast so what are things that make conservation successful in your mind and mm -hmm. what are things that um, make it unsuccessful yeah. Yeah, I think um, being open to like trying new things um, and having that um, innovative spirit of you know embracing failure, um, especially with with climate change, w whether you know you, you believe it or not, um, right? There may be increasing drought or increasing wildfires uh, as we're seeing all over the West, um, but it's not. Um, it's really gradual, right? Like you can't just start planting, um, can't just start planting papayas in Montana because in 40 years, that's gonna be the habitat, right? You, you've gotta, it's gotta be more, um, what's gonna make money this year? Um, and so that to me is just kind of the, that I struggle with. I'm not a scientist, but it's like, you know, you, you can see the trends, but it's like, well, how do we, you know, as you, like in Southern, Calif uh, Southern Colorado, you're seeing some of like the the habitat from Texas and Oklahoma and New Mexico kind of like creeping up. So when you look at it in a 20 or 30 year thing, but it's like, how do you manage for that now and in, in, in this year um, and make money? Um, it's really, I, I, you know, it's not an easy business that you're in uh, rich. I, I don't um, envy you. Um, well, my dad and I, we visit about yeah. the uh, climate global or climate change. Yeah. Yeah. And like we talk about how, and we're big fans of Alan Savory. 
uh-huh. and like how the animal. Wait, wait, did I hear that right? You're you're big fans of Alan Savory. Of Alan Savory. Okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but he talks about how the animal, the ruminant, travels with the moisture in the ruminant. Yeah. And that is so you can actually transport uh, moisture to places where there's desert. You can. Okay. But that's a. It's a sort of a science that not everybody's comfortable with, so I'm not going to yeah. dwell on that very much. Okay. But um, I was trying to make it. Oh, the idea of managing for, and I think conservation is going to play a huge role in this. Pro, pro, conservation, well thought out, holistically thought out, mm-hmm. is going to play a huge role in, I think we've, my dad keeps saying, we've been talking about climate change for so long, yeah, and we um dwell on it and we worry about it we wring our hands about it but we aren't actively managing for it mm-hmm. so um we have to i think that yes we realize that there is climate change uh we realize that it's affecting us on a societal level yeah but what are we what are the steps we're going to start taking to a start addressing it and b start reversing it yeah so well, at least from the conservation perspective, um, there's a. I, I feel like there's an increasing movement of looking at that big picture that you were talking about, where it's not just the four corners of each ranch, but how does this line up on a on a, on a bigger scale of you know mountains to prairie um, or like latitude, and 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 I think that's the beauty of easements, right? The the private landowner owns the property there are deed restrictions that limit some potential uses like subdivision or how many home sites, but it leaves it v- very um, open, right? And so there's room yeah. for um, for wildlife, whether that's big, you know, the big and sexy ones like pronghorn and, and um, deer, mule deer, um, but also the smaller ones like, you know, leopard frogs and, and the, you know, the, the small stuff. And I think that p- piecing together those bigger, and I think that's what's awesome about the private working lands. I think it's almost a billion acres of, of private working lands in the U S um, w- which is, which is tremendous. Right. And, and it connects all those public lands that we, that we know and love that everybody's like recreating on the weekend, right? Like Yellowstone and, and, um, Rocky Mountain National Park, and and so the connectors are these private working lands, and I think that that's, um, and the, at least for the conservation perspective, is how do we how do we make big linkages in these privately owned operations where animals, plants, and animals can move with the changing climate, um, and get the the habitat that they need, and I, I and I think on the private landowner side, and this maybe you don't agree let's talk about it um but i I see that there and and i and i fall in this category it's like oh i'd love to have 100 acres uh to have my you know private little domain um but those those that fragmentation is is really destructive to wildlife habitat and so looking at these bigger operations there and and it depends on where you are in the country right in in eastern colorado we're looking at you know 5,000 acres, 50,000 acres, but big open spaces. S- somewhere like Vermont, um, you're, you're not talking about that size. Um, you're talking smaller. Um, uh, but I think that the, just like having that fragment, and, and people talk about development pressure. It's a different kind of development pressure in these in this ranch world, right? Like if you have a 5,000 acre ranch and you split it up into a bunch of 100 acre ones, that's a, that's a that's a big issue. Um, that all that fencing makes it difficult for a pronghorn to to move around and, and roam around. Um, so we we are looking for, and I, and I think it makes financial sense as well. It's it's hard to make a living when you're when you're on that scale of the, the smaller scale. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that visiting with you has really brought it to the fact that like there is that public. So public, there's that access to public lands that just uh, we have not been able to cultivate in um, in uh, private lands. And mm-hmm. so the intersection I see is there's uh, we have we have all this opportunity to allow people to experience our public our private lands and uh, give them access and that kind of stuff. And we just never looked at it in that part of the way. 
And it wasn't until I met the land trust, uh, Nick DeCosta. Yeah, 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 yeah. And he started really opening my mind to the potential of it. And that, honestly, I did part of it for the economic reasons of doing mm -hmm. it for it, mm -hmm. because it's always nice to have another revenue stream. It sure. creates a little bit of a resilience in a company. But mm -hmm. I honestly really enjoy having guests and talking mm -hmm. to people and mm -hmm. educating people about what we're doing. And especially on the flyaways that we live on and that kind of stuff and to show them, look, here's, here's cattle coexisting with hundreds of th hundreds of thousands of birds set sometimes. And, uh, yeah, they don't bug each other that much. So, <laughs> but, but that, yeah. that comes back to that. This is the core of what I want to visit with about is the easements. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I look, that, I, the, I just wanted to echo your customer service business that, um, Having, I think having the, that meaningful uh, access to your property is, it, when people think about a public access, at least in my mind a few years ago, I was thinking like, right, like open, like trail use of like uh, open space park. But there is such a wide variety of public access that, you know, it could just be one weekend a year, right? Uh, it could yep. be, right. And so I, I just, I feel like it's up to the private landowner of what, what right, what do you want? What do you, what are you, what are you comfortable with? But that, that goes to that overarching component of that should be part of your operation. Mm -hmm. The educational part of it, because beyond just getting the money from those people, mm -hmm. you're also learning from them what their what they mm -hmm. what their preconceived notions mm -hmm. are, mm -hmm. and you're able to tell them how you see the world, and it just makes for. Mm -hmm. I've never walked away from one of those relationships not having gained something. And so, you potentially have a, a more powerful advocate than yourself, right? These people telling your story is more believable than than you pitching it to some unknown person, right? That they're pitching it to their family and friends, and yeah. like you won't believe this guy, Rich. He's doing amazing stuff. Um, yeah. it's so like, it's pretty powerful, yeah. Great to have the advocacy, mm -hmm. and it's it's a relative. It's just so rewarding to develop those kind of relationships. It's just yeah. and uh. Yeah, Jackson worries that I'm uh, not very good at developing relationships. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I feel, I feel like I've seen you burn a bridge or two, uh, and in our, in our time together. Yeah, yeah. Oh, but I do value it. <laughs> so, yeah. um, yeah. no, uh, but that sort of rolls into this, this. I like I said, Jackson always makes me think really have this great, really made my mind grind about the easements. And he has some fears about where easements are going. But I think that it, easements are such a, uh, a integral part of the future and education of the general consumer. Because like I, most of the time when I filter this, I'm different than most ranchers because I filter it through an integrated standpoint. So I, mm -hmm. I talk to the, the, the consumer at the store mm -hmm. and have many different call up and down the supply chain. So I understand from one end how important it is to have, tie those easements back to the, the pr person that's buying the food that you're raising on your operation. Mm -hmm. So can you speak to like, some of the creative strategies you've used with easements, sort of some of the, um, what are the worst possible outcomes that might be in the future of easements? I mm -hmm. see now there's some other people that are worried about three, um, the exchanges, the easements. There's a lot of uh, uncertainty yeah. out there. Yeah. Well, um, I think something important to realize is that easements are, are voluntary. Um, there's no arm twisting. Uh, and I think that that's the danger that, that, there may be some folks uh, that, you know, um, like a land protection project um, manager who, who is look, is afraid of, um, you know, their conversion rate or, or whatever. And, and for me, there's no sales job. It's, it's information. It's like, are, are, is, are you interested in this? If you're not interested in this, do not, don't do it. This is forever. This is right. Like I want happy customers, uh, happy, a happy relationship. Um, and so I feel like there are some that may have that kind of sales tactic of like, you know, the, make a decision, you know, next week. And for me, it's sit on it as, as long as you want. You, you know, there are, there are time, um, you, you are time bound by some, you know, grants from NRCS or, or the fish and game, your state fish and game uh, folks, but you could always apply again next year or, or whatever. That's my view is 
you you want somebody who's very comfortable with with what's what's happening. Um, some of the some of the the stuff you might see in the news is um, syndicates and and inflated appraisals. And for me, those are are really tied together. Is that um, when you, to value an easement? Um, I'll, I'll just talk about that briefly. So uh, when you value an easement. You're looking at the value. An appraiser is looking at the value of the property before the easement, so with no restrictions at all, and that's a value that you should be pretty comfortable with, right? That that's what you bought the ranch for if you bought it in the last few years, um, or like what you're seeing ranches sell for in your neighborhood. Um, but and then the after value um, is after the easement is there are restrictions and, and, and the common ones are no subdivisions. So if you have a thousand acres, you know, that's the size of the ranch. You can't split it up into two 500 acres or 10, hundred. I'm, I'm terrible with math. So uh, <laughs> I think that adds you went into law. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and so that's the, the tricky business with appraisals is that you're valuing something that, um, there isn't a really big market of easement sales. And I feel like in some states you, you're, you're getting a more developed market of, of easement sales. Um, but there's, there's two places where we, we run into trouble. One is that um, it takes one, per, one individual, uh, appraisers are limited by the, the actual sale. So, so this property with an easement on it may be listed for two years, three years. And there's like, you know, so many people are saying, no, that price is, is too high. And then you get one person, and let's make fun of Texas. You get one person from Houston, Texas, who wants to, you know, have his hunting ranch and he'll pay, you know, full price without any, you know, as if there was no um, restrictions on it. And so now the the appraiser is limited by that sale, not by the the fifty people that said that ranch is too expensive. Um, you're you're limited to, to the, the actual sale, and um, and so we're seeing a lot of easements um, showing no loss in value, at least in some parts of Colorado, because people are buying the eased property um, because they're saying, well, I don't I don't want to develop it. And it's like right, but that the potential of being able to develop it sometime in the future is really valuable and you may not want to but that's pay attention um and then the, the i'll just i know i'm rambling but one other with the appraisals oh. is um at least in colorado uh maybe 10 or 15 years ago there was some fraud in that um appraisers were saying that every ranch could have a gravel pit on it um and as you know you really have one commercial gravel pit for God, I don't know how many a uh, hundred mile circle. I don't know how big the the circle of a, a a commercial gravel pit, but they were they were having like every ranch. And so somebody would buy a ranch, um, you know, buy a ranch now, and then in six months they get an appraisal. Let's say you bought it for a million, and then a a, a year from now they got this appraisal that said their ranch was worth twenty million dollars. And at least in at least in my mind, that should be a red flag to Joe Joe homeowner um, of, you know, on the other side, you're you're paying these trained professionals to do this for you, and if they're saying that this is legit, then you know I see both sides. Um, one in my mind, if I bought my house and it went up twenty times in a year, I'd I'd ask questions. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's an interesting marketplace. The yeah. Rant when you purchase a ranch because yeah. there's so many different things that drive it and so mm -hmm. many different desires. So you never know. So there's perfectly good production type oriented mm -hmm. ranches mm -hmm. that don't have the intrinsic value mm -hmm. that a beautiful place is right outside of Jack South of Jackson Hole in Du Bois, Wyoming would have. Right. But that doesn't mean that it can't run five, six hundred hell. Yeah, Kendall, mm -hmm. with very less, more or less environmental impact and support more wildlife than that place that's closer right. to the more popular right. place. Right. And so, if you have a trout in the water that runs through your your place, you're right. That that's more yeah. valuable to 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 some some yeah. market. Right. Right. And that's the, that comes back to the so the valuation. I I uh, I 
I understand because I see it all the time mm -hmm. and I struggle with it in my new career because yeah. there's some beautiful, in my mind as a rancher, there's some beautiful ranchers out there that are way underpriced that mm -hmm. pack a much larger burden yeah. than, uh, yeah. than what the more yeah. epic sort of romanticized ones yeah. are. So, yeah. But... <laughs> I think that that's right. The the uh, in Colorado, that's a struggle, right? You can see, you can see the mountains from these ranches, and, and it gets people um, that right that romanticism that um, you know I can go skiing. I can take an hour and a half drive and go skiing, and, and you do, and you don't get to have that in Kansas. Uh, sorry, Kansas. Uh, sorry to pick on you, um, but and I think that's what we were saying with the the, the access to land. Um, there are some properties, right, that, that may be more, uh, that have a higher carrying capacity that are less expensive just because of that, you know, those mountain views, um, or, or, or your distance to, um, like a resort community, um, like Boulder or Steamboat. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, a, a couple of innovative just kind of ideas that I, that I was working on and that I, I'm, I'm continuing to, to brainstorm with folks. Uh, one was a, um, a affordable ranching concept, kind of like affordable housing where you would, um, you would buy the place um, based on what the ranch could, the carrying capacity of the ranch uh, using, you know, the natural resources on the property, you know, a, a hunting lease, um, the cow calf operation, uh, you know, a uh, uh, fishing guide, you know, th just like what instead of relying on a second job, whether you're a CPA or a, in the oil and gas industry or, or an attorney, um, that's how you get your financing. But now it's like, well, wh what if you're just limited to, right, the natural resources on the property? And I know that there's a, a couple of pilots that are, you know, we, we've gotten a, a couple of appraisals on that. And as you may imagine, the, the, that spread between the before um, before the easement and after that kind of an easement is really, really large. We're talking 80%, 90%. And so it makes it really affordable for someone to, to jump in. But when you leave, whether that's in 10 years or 20 years or 30 years, um, you're, you're restricted to that sales price on the way out. So some, somebody coming in is, is going to pay for it with just oh. their... Um, just that they're, they're uh, you'll have more data at that point, right? You'll, you'll be able to yeah. show like, here's what I'm making. So this is what um, we're going to sell it for. That's amazing. That's a, that's a good concept. So I think that that's the interesting thing. And uh, I think that's, the, we talked, I would never really talked about this on the phone, but mm -hmm. that's the difference between the distributed, the decentralized and decentralized approaches to economies mm -hmm. that's a very distributed type of that means that there's the risk is spread out and the um so there's opportunity to continue to um profit at a meaning meaningful level but never get uber wealthy mm -hmm. so your exit you're not going to walk away super wealthy at the end you're going to mm -hmm. walk away having had a good quality of life, probably mm -hmm. a decent retirement. Mm -hmm. if you manage your money well, mm -hmm. and then you're going to afford that opportunity to somebody to come back. Right. Is it, am I reading that right? Yeah. I, I see it a number of different ways, right? W one, I could see you, you making some good money. If you have a hunting lodge that, um, that you're a great customer service and great guide and, and you can, you can make a good living comfortable. Um, and and you can sell it if you have proof, right? After whatever, I don't know what uh, five years, seven years, I don't know what you would constitute proof in this. I'm making up as I go myself, but um, we call it muddling, know, right? <laughs> but also, I see it as something that may not be right forever. That you, this could be right your gateway drug. That you um, you do well enough that you can buy something at, at market rate um, or you can expand, you can have your, your home base and now you can get a lease with the BLM or you can get right uh, uh, a lease with state land board um, or, or you, you, right, you can buy something that doesn't have the infrastructure, doesn't have the barn and the, and the house, it's just raw land. You can, you can do that when you have a, a, a base. 
And you also, I think the one thing that the value that you didn't touch on was the experience. Mm -hmm. You have mm -hmm. a good, safe place to experiment, mm -hmm. fail, right. and recover. Right. right. And then as you mature, then you're going to be able to take on riskier right. Right. acquisitions and grow your numbers. And like, That's a great point. Yeah. I failed three times. I have three. This I'm on my third catalog. So some of my biggest successes are failures. I yeah. think we need to we, we need to embrace the, <laughs> these failures, right? Yeah. So um I sound like Yogi Berra when I say that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> he uh his science continue to endure on, so there must have been something there. Right. right. <laughs> um let's talk about um I want to talk about the fires. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to try and do something tricky here. I want to talk about the fires. And if you were in your best possible world, mm -hmm. you think they could have been, we can start mitigating these things through conservation, through these creative easement financial structures, um, just general awareness, how it, I, I see it as this all this giant web. Yeah. And that really, if we start focusing on some of these conservation issues, maybe we can start solving some of these problems yeah yeah yeah, yeah i mean very open -ended. just make up yeah. any answer you want <laughs> <laughs> well i feel like with conservation with land management practices you can reduce fuels um to make less severe fires i i think um and i don't i'm not a fire expert all over the u.s but that, that's you know from um the fire folks i know that that's um something that's talked about. Um, I did earn my red card uh, a few years ago, and it's, I think it's, it's a great experience for folks. Um, it takes, you know, like a week, uh, you know, of, of online learning, you know, a couple of hours a night, and then one weekend of doing the, the strenuous uh, pack test um, and that kind of stuff. But I learned a ton from that, from that class, from that experience. Um, and, and so, yeah, I think with, I think another thing is just communication with, with like your neighboring ranches and just like having like a, and, and talking about it and having like a, um, whether it's wildfire response plan for, for, the, for the, the neighborhood or um, prescribed fire plan for, for and it's that way you can, you can manage, as you were saying, in, in chunks of 100,000 acres or 200,000 acres instead of, right, 5,000 acres at a time, you, you can, you can, when you have that kind of communication, I think that th there's better outcomes. What do you think? Yeah, I do. And I think the more people that are trained um, and the bigger, instead of, it's interesting, a lot of insurance companies now will mm -hmm. um, finance, will pay if they have enough inter enough assets that they're insuring in one region, uh -huh. they'll actually go out and hire a fire, fire, fire crew. Just Is that right? Get it. Yes. Cool. Just to be dedicated to that piece of uh, ground. So I think I see that there's a future there. Wait, are you talking about a prevent, like to put out fires or like that they'll come in and do pre prescription? Um, uh, I think that the prescription's a little, I don't know. Is that too, prescription. is that too crazy? Yeah. <laughs> I think they're preventative, but they're also okay. like, they'd be higher, they'd be trained at the level of a contract uh, oh, of like okay, okay. I see what you're so, saying. Yeah, I th I think this is a good segue into this point. Is that there is just a tremendous amount of schizophrenia in fire policy in the U.S. It's it's incredible. Like, there's you know like we need to do um, you know prescribed burning and, and like managing fire, but then like we need to put out fires immediately. And so it's just um, it's tough for me. I'm not again. I'm not in this space uh, um, full time, but it's just an, it's interesting to watch. Um, that kind of um, conflict. Well, interesting. So, fire for ranchers, like some people burn their fields, but they don't really do this wide scale, really prescriptive burning. But then I was looking at some of my soil blocks that I pulled out of a, uh, we cleaned up a ditch. So, we got pretty deep in and mm -hmm. it dried out because of the composure of it. And there was flecks of uh, charcoal in it. Uh -huh. It's probably part of the system. Mm -hmm. It's probably important to have that charcoal in there. So I'm not saying you got to be out there burning every year, but it's probably mm -hmm. good to schedule preventative burns yeah. along the way. 
because I think it's just a natural process. It, yeah. Like the, it's part of the holistic mo management model. Is, yeah, so. is, is prescribed fire, um, What's the word for it? Is it um, accepted in Oregon? Let's say pre wildfire season of 2020. Um, what, Cause I feel like this is a setback, right? Um, it is, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's an interesting dynamic. The season changed so quickly. Like it turned like that, which yeah. is unnormal. Mm -hmm. um, but we, um, we're very pro prescribed fire when they're doing it in the winter. Mm -hmm. Not so much when they're doing it in June. Right. 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 <laughs> so they what they do now is they thin, thin it out and they yeah. pile it all up and they do what they call a jackpot right. burn like okay. in December. So yeah. And um, the interesting thing I learned from do you need to get approval from you know the county sheriff or anything, or is it just oh no, this is most because of the county I live in is ninety five percent public land. So okay, we just see it. The ranches and everything. Really? 95? Pretty, nice. Wow. Yeah. So, <laughs> I actually had, my mom gave me a thing. Only uh, 9,000, so it's the third largest county in Oregon. 19th largest county in the United States. Bigger than Rhode Island, probably? Or the, yeah. yeah. It's big, it's, the next biggest <laughs> count, uh, it's bigger than New Jersey. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So, anyways, but of that, only 19,008, how does it? I think there are numbers wrong. But it's less under a hundred thousand acres are pro in the wow. tax base. Yeah. So yeah. the entire county yeah. tax structure is yeah. packed by the private lands. Wow. And well, I mean, there's all sorts of different ways taxes come in. Yeah. But right. For right. that tax base, there's yeah. That's how it. many people are in your county in this New Jersey? Seven thousand. Seven thousand in all of New Jersey. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. If we were if we were a country, we'd be smaller, just a little bit smaller in Puerto Rico. <laughs> Wow. Yeah. Yeah. But, but, and then the next, the uh, 18th is right next to us. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, that, and let's, let's just, I was going to, I was thinking about, we, we got a little bit of time. We could wrap it up with this. Let's talk about the cultures, how we go to mess the cultures, because we talked about this a little bit and we have a different, we have sort of a different thing. And I'm mm -hmm. coming around to like the, the idea that like there is a it's the whole people move into rural communities because there's so, some sort of value yeah and the people that are in the communities see that those people also bring with them different mm -hmm. perspectives and things mm -hmm. they want to see changed yeah and it's sort of a but i think this is a bigger component of solving the larger problem if we can solve this problem yeah and how do we make this transition when we're going both ways? How do we communicate to urban things, the needs of rural America, and how do people entering rural America do so without making too much waves, but still bring about a positive effect on the community? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I've been thinking about this. Um, well, one, I started a podcast recently that just trying to improve that kind of dialogue between ag producers and urban centers. Um, and, I, and I feel like um, my family is in, in Brooklyn and Chicago um, and a few vegetarians and vegans in there. So just like kind of having that um, uh, mental framework of, of like some of those misconceptions of like, you know, if we just plant peas everywhere and we eat the pea protein and we're, you know, and so, um, just like kind of just improving that. And I think both sides need to improve their dialogue, right? Of, of being yes. open to that conversation. But I think another is just um, uh, that culture. And I, I, I don't know if it was you or Micah that made the point of like, you know, when you're traveling to Italy, you know, these people are saying like, respect the culture, you know, we're not in America. And then, but then they go on vacation or they move to uh, Antelope uh and yeah. it's like you know i need my soy latte and um my yoga class and, and i don't and i th what i think is i don't think there's a problem with the soy latte or the yoga but i think it, it is a communication and like openness to um 
that there isn't like a, a right way and a wrong way and like a backwards way. It's just, th if this is what you prefer, you can have, I mean, I feel like you can have those things, um, but you have, you have to be a good neighbor and be open to their way, right? And and you, I don't know, I, I feel like it's not just black and white of like, you can't have your your yoga class um, where, you, where you move to. What do you, what do you yeah. think? Well, I lived up in, uh, I live in a really funky community that, uh, called twisp in winthrop washington okay and they sort of have that uh their community gelled in the 70s uh -huh. when um the aspen the corporation that owns aspen ski resort uh -huh, uh -huh. wanted to move a resort into their area okay and there was this all these hit really like really counterculture hippies yeah ranchers loggers yeah and uh of really contingent of firefighting people because that's mm -hmm. one of the original smoke jumper bases. Okay. So they had these three really What's the name of the place again? Twisp and went through Washington. Okay. All right. I'll check it out. Mm -hmm. So they had these really distinguished different cultures that up mm -hmm. until the ski resort hadn't really gelled together, but they, they yeah. were getting along. They were making yeah. it fine. And then they all sort of united and created this really dynamic and pleasant community to be part of and mm -hmm. live there. I lived there for four years and mm -hmm. on and off for like 10. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they got the yoga, they got the soy, they got the law, they got the saw <laughs> yeah. shop, they got yeah, the, yeah, yeah. The, the place and everybody mm -hmm. sits at the same bar, sits at the same table. And yeah. after 30 years, it's this mm -hmm. big uh, thing. And uh, it was yeah. so, uh, right. the, I think, yeah, the, the other is like, is, is do you guys have the same goal, right? Is the goal a thriving community with you know a, a sustainable economy? And that, you know, if you, and I think that's like where we're, you're you're going down the the Rajneeshi antelope thing is they didn't have the same goal, like right? So it, I feel like there's a difference, right? When you're you're on the same team, you may have different ways of getting there, but if you have the same goal, I feel like that that helps tremendously. So that's what we, we've solved it. We just need to, every community needs to find <laughs> what the same goal is. Right. <laughs> what you were just saying uh, reminds me a lot of Paonia in Colorado. I don't know if you've been over to Paonia, but they've got um, like, you know, really funky coffee shops and, and but also, you know, the coal industry and the, and the solar industry and uh, um, the high country news publication. I mean, it's, it's like a, it's a really eclectic town. Yeah. And I think people actually enjoy that yeah. when they're not, yeah. whether that conflict has been, and yeah. I don't know what gelled them, yeah. but it'd be interesting to study those. Yeah. Things. Yeah. So, so give us a little bit more. Uh, you've done one podcast so far. Yeah. I've, I've done one uh, that's in the books. Um, haven't hit the publish button yet. I, I'm waiting for another couple just to have like a little buffer. Um, but I also have another one scheduled for tomorrow and another one next week. Um, but yeah, talking to, to real life, Farmers and ranchers, um, and and just having, cause you know, um, kind of addressing those misconceptions of like you know like the last one we talked about you know you can be flippant and just say you know cover crops uh, uh, you know problem solved um, but we talked about you know, what are the barriers why can't you have uh, why can't you do this sometimes um, you, and so I think it's really fun and I think it's um, I think. It, I'm excited to share it with some of my friends in Denver and Chicago and LA and, and just, uh, and I'm also excited for the other side of, of hearing questions from them of, Hey, can you ask about this? Like, you know, why am I not seeing more um, of this in the grocery store? And I think that the short answer is, with lots of questions is follow the money. Um, yeah. And, and people say they want some things and um, you don't, you have to pay a little extra for that. And people tend to not to. And I know that I'm speaking from my personal experience, right? Um, I'll, I'll take ownership. I'm not pointing any fingers at anybody, but um, just recently I've made the conscious decision to start paying a little extra for those things. Um, whether it's buying something from the local business instead of from Amazon or, or trying to eat more local produce. Um, it's it's hard. It's really hard. I, I, I'm a thrifty son of a gun, and so it's hard to like say, <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna pay an extra dollar right for this. Um, yeah. So, I I'm with you on that. It's, it's a challenge. It's a, something you have to consciously yeah attempt to do. Right. Is this important to me? If it is, then let me vote with my dollars. 
Yeah, but the quality is usually better. I uh, I agree. My, my little I'm microcosm a... <laughs> is farm raised eggs. Yeah, they're harder to find than you think. Yeah, but yeah. The, the quality is is immensely different. I mean, uh, yeah, we're it, we're we're finding that every every turn we make, we're, we're like, I can't believe we didn't do this sooner. Um, yeah. So give it a try, listeners oh. out there. Yeah. <laughs> well. I appreciate you getting on and uh, visiting. I think this was uh, this is exactly how I felt this conversation would go. <laughs> I'm watching the comments over here. It looks like people are enjoying it. So awesome. Well, yeah, glad to it. have a lunchtime chat with you, Rich. Have a yeah. great day. What else? Uh, you got anything else you want to say before we sign off? No, I'll shoot a link to my website, uh, my new podcast website, in the comments when I when I get out of here. Yeah, and. Uh, Thanks for braving being part of the Far Reaches uh, greater community. Yeah, yeah. Looking forward to catching up with Micah too. He's a he's a hoot. He's a, yeah. know, he's, a he's a good dude. <laughs> well, right on, man. I'm gonna right. call you in this one, and uh, we'll talk to you later down the road. All right. See ya. All right. Bye.